we are incredibly lucky to have Tracy Fullerton here. <laughs> Many people know Tracy as someone who's an incredible mentor, who's helped to build the, the games and digital media program at USC. Um, but I think people don't recognize enough what an incredible auteur Tracy is and the fact that she is amazing at designing and thinking about producing really creative and interesting work in this medium. Uh, so if you think of something like The Night Journey, which she did with Bill Viola, that's been shown all over the world in galleries, including here at the Museum of Moving Image. Uh, so we're really lucky, I think, to have her here talking about something that is still a work in progress for her and sharing and opening up her design process to us as, as it unfolds. So please welcome Tracy Fullerton to talk about the whole thing. I, uh, you know, the title of this talk is is what it is, but I actually consider calling it, you know, sort of 40 minutes on something I haven't finished. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I'm going to talk uh, today uh, about a project that actually began for me about 10 years ago, um, right after I closed my startup game company, Spider Dance. Uh, uh, before that, I had been uh, working uh, in the games industry in various uh, various places, RGA here in the city, I had the pleasure of working with Frank and Eric and uh, a number of other talented folks. Um, uh, I you know done projects for Sony and Microsoft and and then for my own company and I you know had run that business as well as designing, which is always a tension and a strange conflict as, as uh, Dancer alluded to. Um, but so I had just closed my my game company and it was 2002 and of a lingering shock of 9-11 combined with my own sense that I, I needed a change, sent me on a 10,000 mile road trip around the country visiting crazy spots that intrigued me for one reason or another. Um, I was actually rereading Walden on the way and, and so of course uh, I, I made the time to visit the pond. I actually have a, a lot of family in that area. My, my family's been there since actually before the revolution. Uh, and uh, so. Um, uh, I, I'd been there before, many, many times, uh, when I was a kid and, and growing up. Uh, but this time I was there on a day when the pond was strangely silent. Um, it was a rainy day um, and damp. And I basically had it to myself. Um, so it was very quiet in that way that uh, sort of a damp, rainy wood can be as you, as you um, walk through it. And as I was leaving, I stopped by the replica of Thoreau's house that's uh, in the parking lot. Um, it's actually not at the site. And um, the door was sort of partially uh, cracked open and uh, I could see a very still silhouette of the author sitting near the fireplace reading. Uh, I thought it was a dummy. And uh, so without ask asking permission to enter, I just walked right up, opened the door and went in. Uh, and the silhouette uh, sort of turned to me and closed the book and said, greetings, traveler. Uh, and, and proceeds to reveal that he's uh, a historian. Uh, we actually didn't reveal the time, I learned later. Uh, he proceeds to have a conversation with me actually in the guise of Thoreau. Uh, and you know, like a kind of living museum, which we've all, you know, I think probably experienced, uh, it was really wonderful and personal. Uh, and uh, we, we had a very long discussion about the sort of system that uh, Thoreau lays out uh, in, in the book. And so that night in my notebook, which I kind of keep, I jotted down, I'd like to make a game about this experiment that Thoreau tried out. But I have absolutely no idea how. And I wrote it in the notebook and I went on and I went back to, you know, I ended that particular sojourn and went back and uh, that was about the time I started the program at, at USC and kind of changed gears in the way that, that, that Richard really spoke about this morning. Um, so it kind of, uh, that change in gears uh, allowed me to start exploring a much richer, much more interesting design problem in, in my work. Um, and including a really, really difficult design product, I will say, like, like Cloud and the Night Journey. Um, and so, uh, actually, uh, here it is. Uh, this is really difficult to see uh, on this projector because it's a picture that all that doubles, and so this projector is kind of, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 
something happened to me, I think, uh, over the course of designing the Night Journey, and that is um, with, o over a long-term interaction with, with Bill Viola, who, of course, approaches his work as an artist, uh, I started to question uh, my own approach as a game designer. Not that I thought that I was wrong, but that I thought that I could enhance or sort of layer my process with some of the things that, that I learned from him. And one of the things that I learned from him was that you don't necessarily have to know the answer or even be very clear on the answer when you begin a design process. You just have to know the question and be very clear on what intrigues you about that question. And then you can be open to allowing a, a, a project to grow and change because you've got your eye on the proverbial ball. It is the question and what intrigues you. And if you can keep that, then all of the blur around you as, you, as this sort of messy design process occurs, is actually completely okay. So in 2007, about the time we finished the main design work uh, on the night journey, and we were essentially just doing production, uh, I bought a stack of copies of Walden for the team at the Game Innovation Lab, and passed them around for everyone to read and take notes in. And that was the beginning of my commitment to trying to figure out this problem. Sorry, I'm a big water drinker, so I'm going to keep doing that. Okay, so let's talk about the man himself. Um, actually, until he started keeping a journal in 1837, there wasn't much remarkable about Henry David Thoreau. He was born in 1817 in Concord, Mass., where he would spend most of his life. Uh, his family made pencils, uh, which, given his eventual career as a writer, seemed somewhat appropriate. Uh, he actually invented a better pencil. Um, has a patent on it. Uh, he attended Harvard and was a good but not a brilliant student. And after he returned home um, from, from university, he got a job as a teacher, which he promptly quit uh, because he refused to beat the students. Just, you guys are students, just keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, so at about that point, uh, he embarked on a career of walking and thinking and getting to know the area of Concord pretty much better than anyone has likely done before or, or since. Um, and supported by a series of odd jobs, uh, such as building fences and surveying land, uh, Thoreau was probably best known to his neighbors at the time as that fool who burned down the woods because of an unfortunate camping incident. So in 1837, shortly after befriending uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, he began keeping a journal, apparently at, at Emerson's provocation. And this lifelong work included all of his observations about Concord, his environment, the details of the wildlife and the terrain and the ponds, the water levels, the people and the animals. Uh, and these observations would form the basis of his published writings. And for the just scores, I mean, just amazing numbers of, of scientists and scholars and philosophers and artists uh, and you know otherwise who've been uh, inspired by his work, they've also formed the basis of other uh, uh, investigation. So just as an example, one, one example, within the past few years, the NSF has funded a study using Thoreau's notes on blooming uh, uh, times uh, to understand the effects of global warming on the local area. Um, his are so detailed that they can be compared to those of today and we see the change. So Emerson and Thoreau, as we, we all know, were famously great friends and they were part of a larger circle of intellectuals in Concord. And Emerson's house sat at the outskirts of the town, um, uh, which that town really, in hindsight, seemed uh, home to a statistically improbable number of great writers. But his house was at the what we might think of as the liminal edge uh, of that town, um, right before you entered the woods that Thoreau would spend so much time in. Uh, and so while Concord is certainly a town and not a city, it was civilization, really, enough for Thoreau to push back on it and wish to escape it. Um, and in 1845, Emerson um, allowed him to build a cabin on his woodlot, um, which is a, a piece of land on the north shore of Walden Pond, uh, in, in order to conduct what Thoreau called an experiment in living. And there were a lot of actually exper such experiments going on, mostly <coughs> like experiments, which he wasn't interested in at all. Um, so not much attention was actually uh, paid to Thoreau's uh, solo experiment. Uh, besides Emerson and some other poets and writers um, who visited him in the cabin, uh, for the most part he was free to just live as, he, as simply as he liked, <coughs> coming and going uh, uh, from town to the solitude of the woods. 
with Emerson's house there at the dividing point as a way station and kind of a, a lending library all in one. So one of the things that always struck me uh, about the book is it's a mix of both the quantitative and the qualitative outcomes of that experiment. Uh, it's kind of very loose narrative. I mean, you can just almost barely call it a narrative. It sets out the goals and the structure of the experiment which obviously we know were to live as simply as, uh, as he could to determine what were the essentials of life. Uh, and it goes on uh, about describing the detail of his findings, his like, scientific findings, uh, about how much it cost him to, to live, how much work he did during each season, about his needs for survival and for society or not, uh, and for, the, for those things that he required beyond mere survival. Um, he only describes the first year of the experiment in detail beginning in the summer and leading into fall, winter, and finally the spring of that first year. Um, it's all about the basics of, of how he lived his, his life and built his home and fed himself. Um, and you know, what's interesting is, I think we've all experienced this, the mundane tasks of life, like washing dishes or whatever, riding the subway, uh, often let our minds wander to make interesting connections. And Thoreau was no different. So while he was planting his green field, uh, you know, he was uh, pondering how many of his fellow farmers became bogged down by planting larger and larger bean fields just to make more money to build larger houses and then need more money to upkeep uh, those houses. And he finds, he says, that most men are so occupied with the factitious cares and superfluously coarse labors of life that its finer fruits cannot be plucked by them. So, the design challenge here um, uh, is to embody that experiment. He, he went to the woods, as, as we know, the quote, to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life. Um, we know that part of the quote. But then he goes on to say more clearly uh, that his goal is to reduce life to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world. Or, if it were sublime, uh, to know, uh, to, to know it by experience and to be able to give a true account of it. Um, and I, I would suspect that most of us know, you know which side throw kind of en ended up on, um, but for our players, uh, we wanted to leave that question open um, and to allow them to find their own path through the experiment. So these are the beginnings. And as a game designer, what I do, I often stop, start thinking about any world that I'm interested in um, by build, trying to understand and model its underlying systems. And later, of course, these underlying systems will be expressed in mechanics and, and perhaps wrapped in, in uh, media uh, that bring them to life and that lure players into their exploration of that system. Um, and, and this is, uh, I believe, one of the things that actually created that inkling in my mind on that, that, that day I visited the pond. Uh, because he was an amateur naturalist as well as a poet and philosopher. And he described the systems <coughs> of his world in detail, merging the scientific and the sublime, the personal and the universal, um, the natural and the aesthetic. His, his book is really a rare text that stands fully in the arts and humanities as it does in the sciences. And to me, it's proof that the way we divorce these domains, just as an aside, is arbitrary and, and extremely unhelpful. So first, our team had to understand Thoreau's systems, because this isn't a book about how we would, I mean, this isn't a game about how we would um, live in the woods. Uh, we wanted to know about his ideas. So we need to understand his system. And in the first chapter of the book, um, Thoreau actually specifies four basic necessaries of life, he calls them, uh, which are food, fuel, shelter, and clothing. And only when we've obtained these things, he says, are we able to um, adventure on life. Beyond these necessities and, and interwoven and finding them um, are the rest of the topics of the book, including inspiration found while reading, in solitude, uh, in the sounds of civilization that he hears through the environment, um, and his visitors that came out to, to, to be with him, human and otherwise. Um, what you're seeing here, by the way, are various screenshots from very rough prototypes all along the way trying to discover best how to create a system that integrated these ideas as the basic rules uh, of the world in a way that, that players could appreciate 
their relative forces and importance uh, in the experiment. What it comes down to really is a tension between sustaining life and seeking inspiration, or sub Thoreau's sublime. And as we've all experienced, that tension usually comes down to a couple of tough issues. How much time we need to spend taking care of those basic needs, and how we choose to spend our leisure time. Um, Thoreau felt pretty strongly that the simpler we chose to make our lives, the more instinctively we would tend towards the sublime and away from the grind, so to speak. In designing our system, though, um, what was important to us, uh, even as we abstracted the elements of life in Thoreau's Walden, um, we also wanted to allow for real variation and deviation uh, in how the player chose to um, uh, play out their own experience. So one truly important relationship in the game um, was, was between energy, uh, what Thoreau called the vital heat, uh, and the effort that we humans need to put into maintaining that. So food, fuel, shelter, and clothing help sustain that vital heat, but the very effort that we put into maintaining those needs drains that energy as well. Um, and of course, if we let those uh, needs fall by the wayside, uh, then their absence can be a drain on our well-being. Uh, in our game, time actually revitalizes this energy, um, while also wearing on our basic needs, because of course we use up these, uh, these resources. Um, what we're really after, of course, is that sublime inspiration, uh, which Thoreau finds uh, through attention to things like reading, uh, sounds, uh, solitude, and visitors. And of course, time also wears away on our moments of inspiration. So we need to keep attending uh, to these things as well. We might be lured to take jobs to make our lives, or money to make our lives uh, easier. Um, but the money that we could use on necessities, so uh, to, to, to purchase, to save time, also tends to be uh, allure and attract us towards luxuries, uh, like bigger houses and fancy tools. Uh, in our game world, you can uh, explore the world, uh, perhaps finding uh, what are called arrowheads, uh, what we call arrowheads in our, our, our world, uh, which are the relics, um, in this case, not of former inhabitants, as, as uh, Thoreau imagined, but of Thoreau himself. Uh, each arrowhead is actually a, a moment uh, of note from, from Walden that fills our own player journal, uh, which winds up actually building a procedural narrative of our own virtual experiment. Uh, the last connection here is something we realized late in the process, that inspiration also had to affect energy, because otherwise it's always a grinding game, and I'll show you uh, why a little bit later. So one thing that's um, important is that there's no winning or losing of this experiment. Um, though each player may judge the outcome uh, by their own standards, the environment of the game provides feedback about the way you're living and we hope will influence your sensibility about that experience. In much the same way that Thoreau's own descriptions of Walden are a form of object objective correlative regarding his own experiment, our game will become richer and filled with more potential as you live a life in balance and less rich and more mundane, um, but certainly survivable, as you live the life of Thoreau's um, fellow townsmen, whose misfortune, he said it was, to have inherited farms, houses, barns, cattle, and farming tools, because these things are more easily acquired than got rid of. So, for example, and there's no way that you could possibly see it on this uh, projector, the world will literally, literally fade um, and become, sure, if you want to do that now, um, become less lustrous um, if you spend too much time in daily tasks. And conversely, if you're able to balance your, your basic needs and your more ephemeral needs, um, the world become more lush and filled with uh, potential discovery. Um, so it's actually an interesting problem to use the world itself as a meter because it requires players to exercise a type of visual acuity that's a, a rarely developed ability. Um, to re and, and so you really need to reflect on how you feel about the world um, as, you're, as you're playing. In early playtest, um, players are actually, they, are, they articulate that they feel that something's changing and they feel more positively or negative ab about it, um, which is uh, what we're going for. Um, so it's a good sign. We're probably tuning this to the, to the uh, last moment, though. 
uh, to support the uh, use of our visual world as a meter, we set the world in a kind of lush, romantic realism so that the extremes will be no more noticeable. It felt <laughs> So was his book, right? He went to live in isolation to remove all the excess complication. That's what we're doing here. And I hope that as you say to yourself, oh, why is it that when I do this in the game, I get this back and why, and, and versus this other feedback, oh, wait a minute, I see. I'm not being rewarded for spending you know, too much time uh, you know, being a bean farmer, right? And starting to think about why the system works the way it does. And you know, for me, the games I play, I, th I, I do think about why I'm being rewarded. And I do think it's been a training for me in my life as part of the capitalist society that if I work hard and I grind hard, then I'm going to get more and I have more. And that that's the right thing to do. Wait a minute. OK, I don't know <laughs> sure that's exactly right. You know, so, so everything like leads to this weird conclusion that I don't quite agree with. And so I want to make a system that doesn't do that. Do I, am I choosing? Yeah. I'm, choosing a hard, I'm choosing a hard question. It's, it's going to come from Aaron. Um, I, first of all, it's a really, really interesting talk, and I thought I had a really amazing resume because Dan's talk that came just before. Right. In a sense, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. are the things that are interesting. 
what, I mean, what really struck me as interesting is that when Dan has a list of, I forget which list, which of the many interesting lists it was, but it was <laughs> the sort of the, the models for user creation engines or something like that, and it had like non-zero sum and social exchange and trade and things like that. It's almost like a little model for a utopia, right? Like you could imagine, well, based on these good proper game design principles, what would it mean to design a society or a, a, a culture around it? But it, and in a sense, that Walden also is that, right? It's, it's not. It's not a social. It's a mini. It's a, it's a mini, mini society utopia, of one. Right? It's a yeah. utopia of one. So it just strikes me that it's sort of there's this kind of interesting synergy, thinking using games as a way of thinking about the notion of the well lived life or meaningful life, what alone or with others. Right, and and God forbid this would be the only game. I mean, I certainly don't want to make a game that defines how games should be made, right? Uh, but what I, what I do want to do is explore this particular idea. You know, the, the text um, is very hard for people to read. I tried to, um, you know, get my niece interested in it, um, but I just couldn't, you know. Uh, and and it's it's kind of rambling, and weirdly, as I, the more that I work with it, I realize that it actually is almost procedural. He took blocks from his journal, and he just made a little recombinant narrative about things that happened to him. Right? So that's what I mean, it's like a partly a qualitative outcome because it's like he journaled and journaled and journaled and journaled and then you know, he wrote this thing five times before he published it. And, and that you know, wasn't the same where you could just cut and cut, you know, it was not like that. So <laughs> it took a lot to take those and you know, recombine them and think of how to tell something that isn't actually a story. Um, so it's actually really a great text to work with as a, as a game designer because it's so about systems, so much about systems in the world and it in itself is a little system. Uh, there were some hands up in the in the back, yeah, the floor, yeah. That's you. Okay, uh, so I, when you had your flow chart of kind of, you know, uh, these were the things that decrease uh, energy and inspiration. Yeah. I found that really interesting because almost everything on there is measurable in both the game and, the, and in the real world in, yeah. in a way that like a player couldn't disagree with, yeah. right? <coughs> but there seems to be, and, and maybe you can correct me on this, uh, like there's almost an inherent value judgment in there, right? Like Thoreau's oh, work mm -hmm. says like, I'm experimenting. I sort of assume there's gonna be this great sublime experience for me out there in nature, but I'm gonna go out there and find out whether or not that was true and, and tell people. But it seems doubtful to me that a player would find like, you know, virtual nature kind of thing, right? To, to be truly sublime. They might just see it and think, this makes me think the same thing Thoreau thought. I think the same problem with the night journey, right? I mean, there's the real spiritual, spiritual journey, and then there's the representation of the spiritual journey. And, and really the notion of the sublime is too large encompassed by a media experience, but um, that's not to say we can't point at things, that we can't... Well, so I guess my question is just how do you define what gives the player inspiration, and how do you how do you give the player room to, like, make their own judgment of that, right. instead of, you know, the game telling them what That's a inspiring. great question. So, so um, we have elements that we hope will be provocative of, of that feeling of creating a Any, anywhere, actually, there's those moments when the rest of the world just kind of clicks in around us, and you go, oh, oh this is special, right? Um, and so we have sort of uh, places and sort of uh, um, moments that we have uh, potentially put there, um, depending on, on the, the player's state, uh, and we hope that that will happen. I mean, that's, that's what, I mean, this is a work in progress, so a lot of that is, remains to be tested and but so far, it seems to be looking pretty good, actually, that people will kind of, you know, will stop uh, at a particular place uh, for, a, for a moment and just all of a sudden they'll just go, oh, wow, this is amazing, you know, for whatever reason for them. Uh, so, it, so it tends to be working. This diagram, I just want to say, is uh, also a work in progress. So, so it's very funny. My team thinks it's very funny that I, that I put a thick art on it because literally for the last two years I've carried versions around this in my pocket <coughs> like napkins and you know backs of like you know my bills and, and you know envelopes and, and, and we're constantly drawing and redrawing this to try and figure it out. So they're like, oh you 
But then, you know, nature would just throw something at you and your crop will fail and, you know, <laughs> right. suddenly all your wise choices are... Right. But maybe that's not the goal. Or There's weather, but it's not particularly scary. Mm -hmm. The one thing it does is, is, as I mentioned, it changes the, um, uh, you know, the growth cycle. Mm -hmm. So um, it probably will seem unpredictable to a player, not um, within reason. around. 
slaughtered Homer's mom. And he was, do, you know, he was doing serious work. I'm not saying he wasn't doing, he was doing serious work, right? Uh, but, but, but he's not, he's not a stodgy old man. He died very young. And he's not a stodgy old man. He's, he, and his writing is actually filled with sort of joyfulness, you know, in doing that. And that's one of the things we want to uh, communicate. I mean, if anything, I'd like to just have kids like my niece not think he's a stodgy old man. <laughs> Thank you. 